Chapter 4 of The Daughter of the Commandant by Alexander Pushkin Translated by Mrs. Milne Holm This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson The Jewel Several weeks passed, during which my life in Fort Bielogorsk became not merely endurable, but even pleasant. I was received like one of the family in the household of the Commandant, the husband and wife were excellent people. Ivan Kuzmich, who had been a child of the regiment, had become an officer, and was a simple, uneducated man, but good and true. His wife led him completely, which, by the way, very well suited his natural laziness. It was Vasilisa Igorovna who directed all the military business, as she did that of her household, and commanded in the little fort as she did in her house. Maria Ivanovna soon ceased being shy, and we became better acquainted. I found her a warm-hearted and sensible girl. By degrees I became attached to this honest family, even to Ivan Ignatyitch, the one-eyed lieutenant, whom Shravidin accused of secret intrigues with Vasilisa Igorovna, an accusation which had not even a shadow of probability. But that did not matter to Shravidin. I became an officer. My work did not weigh heavily upon me. In this heaven-blessed fort there was no drill to do, no guard to mount, nor a view to pass. Sometimes a commandant instructed his soldiers for his own pleasure, but he had not yet succeeded in teaching them how to know their right hand from their left. Shvabrin had some French books I took to reading, and I acquired a taste for literature. In the morning I used to read, and I tried my hand at translations, sometimes even at compositions in verse. Nearly every day I dined at the Commandant's, where I usually passed the rest of the day. In the evening Father Garasim used to drop in, accompanied by his wife, Akulina, who was the sturdiest gossip of the neighborhood. It is scarcely necessary to say that every day we met, Shvabrin and I, still hour by hour, his conversation pleased me less. His everlasting jokes about the commandant's family, and above all his witty remarks upon Maria Ivanovna, displeased me very much. I had no other society but that of this family within the little fort, but I did not want any other. In spite of all the prophecies, the Bashkirs did not revolt. Peace reigned around our little fort, but this peace was suddenly troubled by war within. I have already said that I dabbled a little in literature. My attempts were tolerable for the time, and Sumorokov himself did justice to them many years later. One day I happened to write a little song which pleased me. It is well known that under the color of asking advice authors willingly seek a benevolent listener. I copied out my little song and took it to Shavrin, the only person in the fort who could appreciate a poetical work. After a short while I drew my manuscript from my pocket, and read to him the following verses. By waging war with thoughts of love I try to forget my beauty. Alas, by flight from Masha I hope my freedom to regain. But the eyes which enslaved me are ever before me. My soul have they troubled and ruined my rest. O oh, Masha, who knowest my sorrows, seeing me in this miserable plight, Take pity on thy captive. Well, what do you think of that? I said to Shvabrin, expecting praise as a tribute due to me. But to my great displeasure, Shvabrin, who usually showed kindness, told me flatly my song was worth nothing. Why? I asked, trying to hide my vexation. Because such verses, replied he, are only worthy of my master, Tredyakovsky, and indeed remind me very much of his little erotic couplets. He took the manuscript from my hand and began unmercifully criticizing each verse, each word, cutting me up in the most spiteful way. That was too much for me. I snatched the manuscript out of his hand and declared that never, no, never, would I ever again show him one of my compositions. Shvabrin did not laugh the least at this threat. "'Let me see,' said he. If you will be able to keep your word, poets have as much need of an audience as Ivan Kuzmich has the need of his petit verre before dinner. And who is this Masha to whom you declare your tender sentiments and your ardent flames, 
"'Surely it must be Maria Ivanovna.' "'That does not concern you,' replied I, frowning. "'I don't ask for your advice, nor your suppositions. "'Oh, oh! A vain poet and a discreet lover!' continued Shvirabrin, irritating me more and more. "'Listen to a little friendly advice. "'If you wish to succeed, I advise you not to stick at songs.' "'What do you mean, sir?' I exclaimed. "'Explain yourself, if you please.' "'With pleasure.' rejoined he i mean that if you want to be well with masha mironov you need only to make her a present of a pair of earrings instead of your languishing verses my blood boiled why have you such an opinion of her i asked him restraining with difficulty my indignation because replied he with a satanic smile because i know by experience her views and habits you lie you rascal i shouted to him you are a shameless liar Schwabrin's face changed. "'This I cannot overlook,' he said. "'You shall give me satisfaction.' "'Certainly.' "'Whenever you like,' replied I joyfully, for at that moment I was ready to tear him in pieces. I rushed at once to Ivan Ignatyitch, whom I found with a needle in his hand. In obedience to the order of the commandant's wife, he was threading mushrooms to be dried for winter. "'Ah, Pyotr Andreitch,' said he when he saw me, "'you're welcome.' "'On what errand does heaven send you, if I may presume to ask?' I told him in a few words that I had quarrelled with Alexey Ivanitch, and that I begged him, Ivan Ignatyitch, to be my second. Ivan Ignatyitch heard me till I had done with great attention, opening wide his single eye. "'Do not deign to tell me,' he said, "'that you wish to kill Alexey Ivanitch, and that I am to be witness. Is that not what you mean, if I may presume to ask you?' "'Exactly.' "'But, good heavens, Pyotr Andreitch, what folly have you got in your head? "'You and Alexey Ivanitch have insulted one another. "'Well, a fine affair. "'You needn't wear an insult hung round your neck. "'He has said silly things to you. "'Give him some impertinence. "'He in return will give you a blow. "'Give him in return a box on the ear. "'He another, you another. "'And then you part. "'And presently we oblige you to make peace.' "'Whereas now, is it a good thing to kill your neighbor, if I may presume to ask you? "'Even if it were you, you should kill him. "'May heaven be with him, for I do not love him. "'But if it be he who is to run you through, you will have made a nice business of it. "'Who will pay for the broken pots, allow me to ask?' "'The arguments of the prudent officer did not deter me. "'My resolution was firmed. "'As you like,' said Ivan Ignatyitch. "'Do as you please.' what good should i do as witness people fight what is there extraordinary in that allow me to ask thank heaven i have seen the swedes and the turks at close quarters i have seen a little of everything i endeavoured to explain to him as best i could the duty of a second but i found ivan ignatyitch quite unmanageable do as you like said he if i meddled in the matter it would be to go and tell ivan kuzmitch according to the rules of the service that a criminal deed is being plotted in the fort, in opposition to the interests of the Crown, and remark to the Commandant how advisable it would be that he should think of taking the necessary measures. I was frightened, and I begged Ivan Ignatyitch not to say anything to the Commandant. With great difficulty I managed to quiet him, and at last made him promise to hold his tongue when I left him in peace. As usual, I passed the evening at the Commandant's, I tried to appear lively and unconcerned in order not to awaken any suspicions and avoid any too curious questions, but I confess I had none of the coolness of which people boast who have found themselves in the same position. All that evening I felt inclined to be soft-hearted and sentimental. Maria Ivanovna pleased me more than usual. The thought that perhaps I was seeing her for the last time gave her, in my eyes, a touching grace. Shviabrin came in. I took him aside and told him about my interview with Ivan Ignatyitch. Viny seconds,' he said to me dryly. "'We shall do very well without them.' We decided to fight on the morrow behind the haystacks at six o'clock in the morning. Seeing us talking in such a friendly manner, Ivan Ignatyitch, full of joy, nearly betrayed us. "'You should have done that long ago,' he said to me with a face of satisfaction. "'Better a hollow peace than an open quarrel.' "'What is that you say, Ivan Ignatyitch?' said the commandant's wife, who was playing patience in a corner. "'I did not exactly catch what you said.' Ivan Ignatyitch, who saw my face darken, recollected his promise, became confused, 
and did not know what to say, Svyabrin came to the rescue. Ivan Ignatyitch, said he, approves of the compact we have made. And with whom? My little father, did you quarrel? Why, with Pyotr Andreitch, to be sure. And we even got to high words. What for? About a mere trifle over a little song. Fine thing to quarrel over a little song. How did it happen? Thus Pyotr Andreitch lately composed a song, and he began singing it to me this morning. So I struck up mine. Captain's daughter don't go abroad at dead of night. And as we did not sing the same key, Pyotr Andreitch became angry, but afterwards he reflected that everyone is free to sing what he pleases, and that's all. Shvirabrin's insolence made me furious, but no one else, except myself, understood his coarse allusions. Nobody, at least, took up the subject. From poetry the conversation passed to poets in general, and the commandant made the remark that they were all rakes and confirmed drunkards. He advised me, as a friend, to give up poetry as a thing opposed to the service and leading to no good. Shiabrin's presence was to me unbearable. I hastened to take my leave of the commandant and his family. After coming home I looked at my sword. I tried its point, and I went to bed after ordering Savielich to wake me on the morrow at six o'clock. On the following day, at the appointed hour, I was already behind the haystacks, waiting for my foeman. It was not long before he appeared. "'We may be surprised,' he said to me. "'We must make haste.' We laid aside our uniforms, and in our waistcoats we drew our swords from the scabbard. At this moment Ivan Ignatyitch, followed by five pensioners, came out from behind a heap of hay. He gave us an order to go at once before the commandant. We sulkily obeyed. The soldiers surrounded us, and we followed Ivan Ignatyitch, who brought us along in triumph, walking with a military step with majestic gravity. We entered the commandant's house. Ivan Ignatyitch threw the door wide open and exclaimed emphatically, "'They are taken!' Vasilisha Ivgorovna ran to meet us. "'What does all this mean? Plotting assassination in our very fort?' Ivan Kuzmich, put them under arrest at once. Pyotr Andreitch, Alexey Ivanitch, give up your swords. Give them up. Give them up. Palashka, take away these swords to the garret. Pyotr Andreitch, I did not expect this of you. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? As to Alexey Ivanitch, it's different. He was transferred from the guard for sending a soul into the other world. He does not believe in our Lord. But do you wish to do likewise? Ivan Kuzmich approved of all his wife said, repeating. Look there now, Vasilisha Igorovna is quite right. Duels are formally forbidden by martial law. Palashka had taken away our swords and carried them to the garret. I could not help laughing. Shiabrin looked grave. In spite of all the respect I have for you, he said coolly to the commandant's wife, I cannot help remarking that you are giving yourself useless trouble by trying us at your tribunal. Leave this cure to Ivan Buzmich. It is his business. "'What? What? My little father!' retorted the commandant's wife. "'Are not husband and wife the same flesh and spirit? "'Ivan Kuzmich, are you trifling? "'Lock them up separately, and keep them on bread and water "'till this ridiculous idea goes out of their heads. "'And Father Garasim shall make them do penance, "'that they may ask pardon of heaven and of men.' "'Ivan Kuzmich did not know what to do. "'Marya Ivanovna was very pale. "'Little by little the storm sank. "'The commandant's wife became more easy to deal with. She ordered us to make friends. Balashka brought us back our swords. We left the house apparently reconciled. Ivan Ignatyitch accompanied us. "'Weren't you ashamed?' I said to him, angrily, thus to denounce us to the commandant, after giving me your solemn word not to do so. "'As God is holy,' replied he, "'I said nothing to Ivan Kuzmich. It was Vasilisa Igorovna who wormed it all out of me. It was she who took all the necessary measures unknown to the commandant.' As it is, heaven be praised that all has ended in this way. After this reply, he returned to his quarters, and I remained alone with Shriabin. Our affair can't end thus, I said to him. Certainly not, rejoined Shriabin. You shall wash out your insolence in blood, but they will watch us. We must pretend to be friends for a few days. Goodbye. And we parted as if nothing had happened. Upon my return to the commandant's, I sat down, according to my custom, by Maria Ivanovna. Her father was not home, and her mother was engaged with household cares. We spoke in a low voice. 
Maria Ivanovna reproached me tenderly for the anxiety my quarrel with Svirabrin had caused her. "'My heart failed me,' said she, "'when they came to tell us that you were going to draw swords on each other. How strange men are! For a word forgotten the next week they are ready to cut each other's throats, and to sacrifice not only their life but their honor, and the happiness of those who—' "'But I am sure it was not you who began the quarrel. It was Alexey Ivanitch who was the aggressor. What makes you think so, Marya? Why, because, because he is so sneering. I do not like Alexey Ivanitch. I even dislike him. Yet all the same I should not have liked him to dislike me. It would have made me very uneasy. And what do you think, Marya Ivanovna? Does he dislike you or no? Marya Ivanovna looked disturbed and grew very red. I think, she said at last, I think he likes me. Why? Because he proposed to me. Proposed to you? When? Last year, two months before you came. And you did not consent? As you see, Alexey Ivanitch is a man of wit, and of good family, to be sure, well off, too, but only to think of being obliged to kiss him before everybody under the marriage crown. No, no, nothing in the world would induce me. The words of Maria Ivanovna enlightened me, and made many things clear to me. I understood now why Shvabrin so persistently followed her up. He had probably observed our mutual attraction, and was trying to detach us one from another. The words which had provoked our quarrel seemed to me the more infamous when, instead of a rude and coarse joke, I saw in them a premeditated calumny. The wish to punish the barefaced liar took more entire passion of me, and I awaited impatiently a favorable moment. I had not long to wait. On the morrow, just as I was busy composing an elegy, and I was biting my pen as I searched for a rhyme, Shvabrin tapped on my window. I laid down the pen and took up my sword and left the house. "'Why delay any longer?' said Shvabrin. "'They are not watching us any more. Let us go to the river bank. There nobody will interrupt us.' We started in silence, and after having gone down a rugged path, we halted at the water's edge and crossed swords. Shvabrin was a better swordsman than I was, but I was stronger and bolder, and M. Beaupré, who had, among other things, been a soldier, had given me some lessons in fencing, by which I had profited. Shvabrin did not in the least expect to find in me such a dangerous foeman. For a long while we could, neither of us, do the other any harm. But at last, noticing that Shvabrin was getting tired, I vigorously attacked him, and almost forced him backwards into the river. Suddenly I heard my own name called in a loud voice. I quickly turned my head and saw Sevilich running towards me down the path. At this moment I felt a sharp prick in the chest under the right shoulder, and I fell senseless. End of chapter 4 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com